There we go. If the sound works, we'll have it up there. If it doesn't work, then uh, so be it. We'll see what, what this looks like. Okay. Now, I've truncated some of these slides from my medical finals uh, proper course, like the big one that I do every year. This is just a bit of fun, of course. These are the cases you can expect in a medical abdominal station. I should know. I examined for some of these. Ironically, even though I'm a cardiologist, when you go to as an examiner for medical finals, you just get whatever station they want you to do. You have some preference. So I've examined for respiratory, neuro, medical abdomen, and cardio, and hands, and all sorts of weird things. So these are the typical cases. The abdominal station is actually probably the easiest one because there's only a couple of things that can come up. It's going to be kidney or liver, pretty much. You might get an abdominal mass, which, re which realistically is going to be big liver, big spleen, or both. So there might be a bit of heme in there, but realistically, it's liver, kidney, and maybe a little bit of heme. That's kind of it for the medical abdomen station. Now, that's good and bad to the finally a medical student. That's good because you only need to learn two or three things. It's not like neurology where quite literally 55 different things could pop up. Um, or cardiology, where it's more like four or five different things, respiratory, maybe seven or eight different things. In the medical abdomen station, realistically, it's two or three things that can come up. So that's good. There's not a much, there's not much breadth of stuff that you need to know. The annoying thing is that you need to know the liver and the kidney in a fair bit of depth because everyone will know it in a fair bit of depth. So if you are really looking to stand out and the kind of medical students I tend to target with my teaching are the ones who are you know, whether you admit it to yourself or your friends, deep down, you know, you want to be in the top decile. That's the kind of people who come to my, my talks generally. So I think if I'm playing to that audience, it makes it very hard to differentiate yourself in this station because it can literally be a thing where, well, everyone knows chronic liver disease to some extent. So how do you stand out? And the, which means your exam technique really needs to be absolutely perfect. The minimum you should be ready for in this station is chronic liver disease, right? and chronic kidney disease. And today I'm gonna to be focusing on CKD. So the stuff you should be focused on before you walk into a medical final station for the abdomen when it comes to the kidneys is you should understand the causes or etiology of chronic kidney disease. You should be pre prepared to talk sensibly about graft function, uh, i.e. when you look at the patient, do they have any active means of renal replacement therapy? And you should be prepared to think about complications of immunosuppression and transplantation because that's effectively what it'll be. A lot of people out there with kidney transplants, a lot of people out there on dialysis, and actually those patients are pretty stable with excellent signs and they can come to exams. Actually, as I can see, more than 100 people have joined. I was waiting for this. Can I just throw up a little poll uh, just for my own? It'll help guide the next couple of talks. Could you just answer this question for me? Because I'm just very curious as to the kind of people that are coming to me. I just want to know if your medical finals exams are this year. And if not, if you're in your first clinical year, that's cool as well. I just want to kind of know the split. Generally speaking, most people who come to hear me talk are doing their medical finals this year. This won't make, obviously, I can't see who's voting for what. So this is anonymous. I just want to see the percentages. Okay, thank you. Just out of interest, there you go. So you are, well, you're in good company. Most of you, 76 out of 94 people who responded are doing your medical finals this year. And a minority, 19% are doing clinical exams this year. So first year OSCEs kind of thing, first clinical OSCEs, but not final. You're very, very, this may be more advanced. That's completely, completely honest. Um, there's no doing first year OSCE kind of revision because that's really just one third of finals and finals is one third of, well, MRCP. So it's, I, I kind of think it's all the same thing. So it doesn't really matter. Okay, inspection in the renal station. Now I'm not gonna teach you how to examine the whole abdomen because if you're a final years and that's kind of what I'm aiming towards, you know how to examine an abdomen. You don't need me to go through it every little bits and pieces. I'm just gonna tell you some basic things you mustn't miss. You must absolutely look for anemia because it's a key, it's a key complication of, of uh, renal failure uh, because of the lack of erythropoietin. So you must look for the anemia uh, in the sclera of the eyes. It's absolutely key. Now, it's not necessary. I've seen people do this for some reason. Uh, you don't need to pull down both eyelids. I can't see how one eye would be different to the other. So just pull down one eyelid uh, to look for anemia. That's perfectly sufficient. There's no need to look in both eyes because, well, it's unlikely one eye will be lying to you. So it doesn't really make any sense. There's this quite specific sign, Lindsay's nails, um, which I did not know as a medical student. So I did perfectly fine in medical finals without knowing this. You don't have to know this. I suppose I'm just saying this to you uh, because uh, as a more senior doctor, you learn this sign is quite useful. The half and half nails or Lindsay's nails uh, is a very specific sign 
for renal disease. You may have read about Bose lines and other things. Bose lines are very nonspecific. It can happen in lots of things, including uh, calcium disorders, parathyroid disorders. Uh, you can get Bose lines from chemotherapy and indeed renal disease. So they're not a very useful sign clinically. It can happen from 50 different things. Whereas Lindsay's nails are relatively specific for renal disease. Just give me one second while I fiddle with the settings of the Zoom. Just one moment. I'm just going to stop allowing participants to start video because someone, I think, tried to by accident. Uh, it's not a comment on you. It's just so it doesn't interrupt the talk. Sorry about this. Let me just put this on the side. Uh, one little screen to share with Zoom. There we go. In the hands, you want to focus beyond the nails on a signs of a fine tremor, which will be a sign of psychosporin therapy. Signs of uh, diabetes so finger prick testing for uh, your BMs. There may, of course, be a, glucom uh, uh, a glucose monitor on the bedside, so keep your eyes open around the bed for that as well. It's pretty important because not only can uh, diabetes be considered one of the biggest causes uh, of end-stage renal disease in, well, most of the world, certainly in the UK, but furthermore, you can get diabetic as a complication of being on steroid therapy uh, for your renal transplantation, so it could be secondary to that. So there is a decent chance that you, you will be at least insulin resistant. And don't forget, just because if it's an abdomen, don't forget to at least mention that you want to look at the jugular venous uh, pulse. And the reason for doing that, and for that, you will have to sit the patient at 45 degrees. Most students, uh, when I'm the examiner, most students will you know, lie the patient flat to start the exam and then get to the face and say, I'd like to check the JVP and move the patient for that. At that stage, I'll tell the, uh, I'll tell the student, you don't need to do that, just move on. But I need to hear you say that so I can tick the box that you said it. Uh, you need to see the JVP. JVP can only be seen at 45 degrees. So I can't give you the mark unless you at least say that. Uh, and I won't waste your time by making you do it because time is kind of ticking by in an OSCE station. So the whole point of that is that the JVP being elevated tells me that you're aware that fluid overload is a key finding in renal failure. If your kidneys aren't working or your transplant isn't working or you are a dialysis patient, then one of the signs will inevitably be your inability to control your fluid level and therefore your JVP will be elevated, which will be a nice uh, way to demonstrate to the examiner that you're keeping your eyes open. <coughs> this scar is very, very subtle. It can be hidden in the uh, skin folds of the neck, the parathyroidectomy scar. It's a sign of tertiary hyperparathyroidism. It's very subtle and it can really, you need, really need to look in the neck uh, to look for this. And it's a, it's a key finding in patients uh, with chronic kidney disease. Patients with chronic kidney disease inevitably end up hypercalcemic uh, because of overactivation of the parathyroid gland. And when that leads to tertiary hyperparathyroidism, as it inevitably does give it enough time, these patients have a risk of generating parathyroid tumors. So they will pre preemptively be treated with parathyroidectomy to treat their hyperparathyroidism. So look for this little scar. It can be incredibly subtle. If you can't see it very well here because it's a pixelated image just from Google, just Google um, parathyroidectomy scar. I'm sure you'll see lots of great examples. One other thing to mention when it comes to parathyroidectomy uh, is the fingers can look a bit odd. To be completely honest, I've never seen, I've done a couple of renal jobs. I've did renal medicine for a year and a half in my training, and I've never seen hands like this. This is a sign of very severe very severe, let me just bring up the laser pointer, very severe hyperparathyroidism. It's the pseudo clubbing. This is not proper clubbing, this is pseudo clubbing. This is because of uh, resorption of bone in the terminal phalanges and shortening of the terminal phalanges, which, is, which can happen as a consequence of the bone metabolism in tertiary hyperparathyroidism. So while it's mentioned in the books, and something you may be, need to be aware of, I have to say this is exceedingly rare and I've worked in lots of transplant centers and I haven't seen this. So I don't think clinically it's common, at least in the UK anymore, presumably because our endocrine surgeons and renal physicians are very good at picking up hyperparathyroidism and treating it before it can get this bad, but this can be a complication and just something to be aware of if you see clubbing or what looks like it might be clubbing. You see how these stubby little nails, it just doesn't look quite normal for clubbing. You may well on inspection see this, right? This is uh, an AV fistula. 
an arterial venous fistula. The proper name for this, for the surgeons amongst you, is this is a, well, I'm going to butcher the, the pronunciation here, so do I do apologize uh, for this. Seminobrescia fistula for hemodialysis. You don't need to know that, uh, need, need to know that unless you really are a surgeon in the making. I think for MRCS exams, this is more pertinent. Um, as embarrassing as it is to me now, I wanted to be a surgeon way back when, so I was preparing for MRCS exams, and surgeons are all about naming scars and naming things really well. So this is one of the things that uh, is in all the MRCS books. One of the, the only pertinent question to a medic when they look at a fistula like this is, is the fistula working? That's really all that matters. And it's a key question in medical finals. You see a fistula, you say, the patient has a fistula, and I pause you and I say, uh, what, what would be the signs that the fistula is working? Or how could you tell the fistula is working? Well, a working fistula will have blood flow in it. So it'll be a pulsatile thing. So you, when you palpate it, uh, it'll be pulsatile. You may even feel the thrill of blood flow. If you listen over it, you'll hear a machinery like murmur or a brewery, uh, which is the blood flow from the arterial to the venous system. And you may see signs like this patient has of bruising, which would be signs that there's been some recent use of the fistula. So if it's, it's probably working if someone's tried to stick a needle in there and put this patient onto dialysis. Complications of fistulas like this? Well, they can clot off um, because there's blood there. Blood can clot off. Uh, you can have high pressure in the venous system, venous hypertension distally. That's generally avoided by these surgeons because they will, uh, they will ligate off the distal cephalic vein, which is what this is made from. This is made from the radial artery and the cephalic vein being joined up. So they'll normally ligate off. Well, they, they should ligate off the uh, distal cephalic vein to stop venous hypertension. But say a branch gets missed or isn't fully done, they can have venous hypertension. So the arm becomes suffused in red. That'll happen normally very quickly after the fistula is formed. So you'll know pretty early. And long term, there can be high output cardiac failure, uh, which is essentially a complication because you've made an abnormal connection between the arterial and venous systems. And therefore, without a capillary network to dampen down your perfusion pressure, you can have basically free flow of blood from A to V, and that can lead to high output cardiac failure. In, in practice, all that means is the patient will be pretty tachycardic at rest, okay? There are some signs you can uh, look for to actually demonstrate that at the bedside, but those are signs I would not expect a medical student to be able to quote. If you're very curious, I can tell you right at the end. Uh, again, it's more of an MRCS thing, so membership of surgical exams after graduation. It's really not something I would expect a medical student to quote to me. Um, you can, of course, have dialysis catheters in place. Non-tunneled versus tunneled. I do apologize how pixelated this is. I was just looking for an open source image on Google. So tunneled catheters are different from non-tunneled because they have a cuff. They have a cuff and they go to a big central vein uh, and effectively they are less likely to get infected because there is a cuff. And that's, uh, that's the benefit of a tunneled line. They can just be in for years and years. Whereas non-tunneled lines are like emergency lines that say I would stick in an A&E or something or an intensive care doctor might do in an, an intensive care unit. Uh, for emergency uh, filtration or hemodialysis. These are generally meant to be changed every five days or so, whereas a tunnel line can stay in for absolutely years. They are meant to be long-term things. Okay, um, we don't need to go into the abdominal scars in detail because today we're just talking kidneys, but uh, the Rutherford-Morrison incision is what I was told, uh, number eight, is what I was told is the nephrectomy scar, and sometimes it can be modified uh, as a... Uh, as an inguinal, uh, as an inguinal oblique incision uh, for inserting a kidney transplant. I have to say, modern surgeons don't ever use the term Rutherford Morrison. It seems to be a real medical student thing. It seems to be a hangover from old textbooks. They just call it a, and sometimes you might hear hockey stick, which is another term I've never actually heard a surgical registrar use. It's just something that doesn't seem to be a practical everyday occurrence in hospitals, but medical students get taught it, so you might as well learn it. Rutherford Morrison is typically your nephrectomy scar, and it'll go around here and may, may extend to the back. Um, generally speaking, if you have a scar below McBurney's point in the iliac fossa, uh, an oblique scar, uh, with the mass underneath it, that's typically your kidney transplant scar. There may be clues at the bedside for the causes of this patient having end-stage renal failure. I'm so sorry, guys. I'm just getting like millions of messages. I'm going to close the chat, yeah, because I can see the direct messages to me so no one else can see them. Uh, but I will take questions at the end if that's all right, just because uh, otherwise I can't kind of keep the flow of the talk going. I promise I will go through the questions at the end. So if you have any questions, leave them in the chat. I'm closing the chat 
now. And I'm also going to silence the Instagram and Facebook notifications on my phone because they are bothering me as well. So I apologize unless, uh, well, I hope people can hear me. Uh, but as long as you can hear me, I'm going to carry on and, uh, and I will take questions at the end. Sorry, guys. Okay. So clues at the bedside. Generally speaking, Asian patients do have a higher incidence of uh, insulin resistance and therefore type 2 diabetes, which is probably the commonest, certainly top three commonest causes of uh, end-stage renal failure in the United Kingdom and United States and probably most of the Western world or anywhere where there is significant Asian uh, population. You'll see some signs in the fingertips of sugar testing, which is useful. Palpable kidneys. Uh, they can be felt on blotting. Sometimes one kidney is larger than the other and patients are typically hypertensive. Those patients have adult polycystic kidney disease, which is inherited in an autosomal dominant manner and remains one of the top three or four causes of uh, end-stage renal failure. The other thing to remember when it comes to adult polycystic kidney disease is there is a risk, and this is more for SBAs, there is a risk of berry aneurysms and sudden intracranial hemorrhage uh, in the brain. So their patients have a risk of stroke from that. The patients also have, because it's also more dominant, have a family history typically, and they need to be, you need to make this diagnosis so you can screen any children or relatives uh, with this because it's also more dominant. And you can have liver cysts in the, uh, you, it's not just the kidneys which are cystic, they can have liver cysts as well. So they may have a palpable hepatomegaly. In my MRCP abdominal station, actually I had a patient with adult polycystic kidney disease and he had a massive liver as well. So big kidneys, big liver. You could just be a vascular path, by which we mean patients who are hyperlipidemic. Of course, diabetes is a risk factor, hypertensive, etc. So if you have vasculopathy, your renal artery can be, oh, just getting a message saying you can't hear me. Can, can people hear me? Yeah. Okay. 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 It's fine from my end. Okay. 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 I'm going to mute the chat now. Sorry. Okay. Uh, fine. So uh, I'm hoping whoever can't hear me, you'll get me back in a second. So uh, vascular disease is, a, is, an important, uh, is an important thing to remember uh, as a major cause of end-stage renal failure. Of course, it kind of, it kind of folds into hypertension and diabetes and your kind of general vasculopathy. These patients have risks of other vascular diseases, so stroke, coronary artery, bypass surgery, scars. They, they will have other signs of other arterial beds like the coronary arteries being affected. The way to answer this question in exam, what are the commonest causes of renal failure? Is just to say the commonest causes, and I'm assuming most of my students are in the UK. I know that we have like 10 or 15 people from Australia who are kind of tuned in now and then, uh, and a few from Malaysia as well. The commonest causes in the UK are hypertension, diabetes mellitus, renovascular disease, and adult polycystic kidney disease. No one will ever grill you on which is number one, because to be honest, hypertension and renovascular and diabetes, I mean, renovascular patients are generally either diabetic or hypertensive, and often they are both. So you could argue that renovascular really is a subset of this. So it's just kind of vasculopathy. How you differentiate these out depends a little bit on which study you're looking at. So they're kind of level pegging for number one, two, and three, however you want to define that. So it's generally a vasculopathy kind of thing. Hypertension is commoner in African Caribbean populations. Diabetes is commoner in Asian populations. But of course, uh, having both is a pretty bad sign and you can just, uh, you can have renal disease from that. The commonest inherited cause is adult polycystic kidney disease. After that, the commonest cause is probably glomerulonephritis, almost certainly. Um, and I say probably because it's sometimes not easy to pick up glomerulonephritis. Certainly is very difficult, even with biopsy, sometimes it's not easy. So we have to presume the diagnosis for chronic scarring. And these patients may present with burnt out glomerulonephritis or scarring. I mean, I had a patient once who came in uh, who was only 30 something actually, and had had chronic headaches and migraines. And they'd been taking ibuprofen four or five times a day over the counter for about 15 years. And they came in with a creatinine of 700. And the only thing we could come up with as a cause was probably that they had scarred their kidneys with NSAIDs, just chronic use of NSAIDs. It's very, very hard to make that distinction, even on biopsy, but that was the consensus. So it can be a little difficult to know exactly what the cause is. Sometimes they just crash land with end-stage renal failure, and it's not very clear as to what the exact etiology was. Other things you need to be aware of are complications of immunosuppression. General immunosuppressive therapy after a transplant involves three agents. You need to give them a steroid, which is normally prednisolone. Uh, 
You need to give them some anti-T cell therapy, which in the UK is normally tacrolimus or cyclosporin. In some centers, it's cyclosporin. In other centers, they like tacrolimus. This is a little bit dependent on which renal team you're with. There, there are local preferences on this. Anti-proliferative agents, generally speaking, MMF um, uh, is now the commonest use uh, agent. Azathioprine has kind of died away. but uh, And that's probably a good thing. Azathioprine used to be associated with anemia, liver fibrosis, lots of uh, lots of bone marrow issues. So MMF is a little better tolerated and is generally the one most, most centers will now use. There may be some complications of immunosuppression. Steroids will cause hypertension, diabetes. Uh, it, the, on the bedside, you will see signs of uh, easy bruising and violaceous striae. I have to say, renal patients on steroids after a transplant tend not to become Cushingoid. They tend not to become Cushingoid because the steroid dose just isn't high enough to do that. They generally are on a low-dose steroid long-term. So that generally doesn't cause them to become overtly Cushingoid. But you may see some purplish um, stretch marks on their abdomen, which, which generally happens even on a low-dose extra steroid. With cyclosporin, one thing to remember, which is really classic for finals and for the SBAs, for the OSCEs and the SBAs, is gum hypertrophy. Uh, and uh, that's a really, really important one to not forget because consultants love asking that question. I love asking that question. So do remember that one. They can have a tremor. Sorry, there should be a comma there. They can have peripheral neuropathy and hypertension from cyclosporin. Tacrolimus increases your risk of uh, becoming insulin resistant and type of diabetic, and tacrolimus can also cause a fine tremor, but not as pronounced as with cyclosporin. The things to be aware of when it comes to transplant outcomes, the only like basics, because I'm not going to give you the deep surgical knowledge on this, you don't need that really for medical or surgical finals, is they want them to be HLA and ABO compatible. If you aren't ABO compatible, you're looking at hyperacute rejection. So at the very least, the blood groups have to match. And generally speaking, they want them to be as well HLA matched as possible as well. So human leukocyte antigen uh, sensitization is, uh, is something they worry about. You want to avoid multiple transfusions in these patients. The more transfusions of blood you give them, the more chances that they will have um, sensitization to HLA antigens and therefore be more likely to reject a future kidney. It's just something to be aware of as a junior doctor that if your patient isn't particularly symptomatic, maybe you can tolerate the hemoglobin of 74, right? You can kind of be permissive with that. So it's, it's just a case of if you aim for a really high transfusion limit, say we want to get them to 80 or 90, which generally we don't, 70 something is probably fine for a chronic kidney disease patient because you want to limit their transfusions and work on the EPO and iron replacement, which is probably a better kind of option for them. Less transfusions means less sensitization. So really try and avoid it unless they're symptomatic. Uh, the most important HLA is HLA DR. The way to remember that is doctors are important. So HLA doctor is the most important. And then uh, HLA B is second, and then A is third. You're listening to Dr. Bajaj speaking, so DRBA. That's the way to remember that uh, in order. It was easy for me in finals, uh, but there we go. So my name is Ritesh Bajaj, DRBA, in that order uh, of importance, DR being the most. Living donors generally give you better long-term outcomes compared to uh, compared to uh, compared to transplants from uh, from uh, dead patients. So if you have uh, come from a heart beating donor, then your kidney may was likely to last longer and have a better long-term outcome. Sorry, just going to quickly make sure the messages are okay. No one's saying something terrible. Perfect. Okay. I will come back to any questions at the end, guys. Sorry, I don't want to. I don't want to slow down because uh, I keep getting the only co negative comment I seem to get is, "Oh, you go, went on too long," uh, which I'm trying to avoid. But uh, if I don't go on too long, then you'll be like, "Oh, you didn't cover that much." So it's hard for me to get it within an hour and cover an entire topic, unless I go on a little bit. We'll go an hour and fifteen today, by my estimation. So just be prepared for that. But you also got to remember, I'm not tying you down to your seat. You can walk away. No one's telling you to be here on a Saturday, because <laughs> no one is forcing you. Okay, perfect. Signs of graft failure um, at the end of the bed. To be completely honest, this is more of an a &E thing, but tenderness or heat over the graft is a sign of rejection. You're not going to get that in your medical finals OSCE. Otherwise, that would be quite worrying. Uh, generally, patients will be very stable there. But if a patient pops up to a &E, a good sign of rejection will be heat over the graft. Tenderness is a little bit more complicated because the graft will not have the same nerve supply. So they may not feel the pain. There may be pain around it from very overt inflammation. So there may be some kind of 
heat and warmth and the patient might feel pain because there is some inflammatory activity in that area. So around there, you might activate nerves, but the actual graft itself won't have any nerve supply. So they may not have many symptoms of pain. It's not a great sign, I have to say. Uh, I mean, if you're feeling pain or for a transplant, it's probably fairly late. That means you've got a big problem going on. Heat over the graft is a good sign of rejection. You can tell if the graft's failed, if the patient has any active renal replacement therapy methods right now. A patient with a working graft will not need to have their fistula needled. So if they've got a fistula uh, with signs of use, like a needle has been stuck in, or they have an active tessiocatheter in place with a graft, that means one of two things. That means, uh, or a Tenshkov catheter in the abdomen. That means either they had the graft very recently and the surgeon just hasn't taken out the other catheter yet, because you wouldn't leave a line in after you've had a transplant, you just take it out. It's just another source of infection. Uh, so either they had the they had the transplant and then came straight to your exams, or they had the transplant and the transplant failed, and they needed to go back onto renal replacement therapy for dialysis, uh, and have now come to your exam with a scar, and probably the graft has failed because they have an active mechanism for renal replacement therapy right now. At the bedside, you can see, of course, anemia, fluid overload with the JV, you might see as well. Uh, and you might see some signs of uremia, which I'm going to come back to. But uh, shall I open the chat just to make it a little bit, uh, just to make it a little bit interactive? Can anyone give me some signs of uremia at the bedside? There's only one I'm really thinking of as a cardiologist, which is kind of the most important sign of uremia. Cardiologist, why would I care about encephalopathy? Anything above the heart is kind of not there for me. All right, thank you. Per pericarditis. Yeah, this, the key sign, I'm going to mute it now, guys. Well done. So uh, the key sign for uremia is uremic pericarditis. And by that, I mean, uh, and I've actually got a slide coming up, so I'm going to double myself here. Uremic pericarditis will cause a pericardial rub. And that's a very, very, very good sign uh, for, for necessitating uh, emergency dialysis. If you're getting uremia with pericarditis, it's a very good sign. Uremic encephalopathy will definitely happen if the urea goes high enough. Of course, by then, you know, the patient's in a real emergency, uh, so they'll need to go to intensive care. But an early sign would be uremic pericarditis. Complications of a transplant? Well, the graft can get rejected. Long-term, the biggest complication is malignancy. And you need to monitor bowel, skin, and uh, lymphoproliferative disorder. Those are the three big ones. Uh, skin in particular, they get a huge number of basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas. And generally speaking, most patients long-term after a transplant should be at least under a regular skin review with a doctor, dermatologist. Complications of long-term steroids, of course. I, I, like I said, they don't tend to get overtly Cushingoid, but there's lots of cardiovascular uh, outcomes with this, high lipids, sugars. So uh, the cardiovascular risk factors are high. There's a high risk. Patients with kidney disease generally have a high risk of cardiovascular complications, i.e. myocardial infarction. Uh, and these patients uh, have a very high risk of coronary artery disease. Adult polycystic kidney disease patients are really, really good to bring to history stations as well as OSCEs. Just be aware in the history, the only thing to, be, uh, to really look out for uh, is a history of loin pain. There may be overt hematuria and the patients will be chronically hypertensive as well. And the reason for the hypertension is that the um, polycystic kidneys are producing a lot of erythropoietin uh, just because of the cysts. The cysts produce lots of EPO and they'll be hypertensive. Sorry, not EPO, excuse me. Uh, they'll be producing a lot of renin uh, and the renin will make them hypertensive. And remember, there's a long-term risk of Mary aneurysms and the risk of intracranial hemorrhage, like we mentioned. Uh, do you generally, the one thing I haven't put on this slide is generally patients with adult polycystic kidney disease have to have fa uh, family screening. The typical family screening method is a renal ultrasound, which is a good way of seeing if, they're, if their children or, or any other relatives have polycystic kidneys. It's a good way to look for it without using any uh, radiation. There is a uh, cardiac complication of adult polycystic kidney disease. Does anyone want to mention it? If I open the chat very quickly, a cardiac complication of adult polycystic kidney disease, which is fairly, you know, it's not uncommon. 
Yeah, Kush uh, says, uh, sorry, someone says mitral regurgitation. I shouldn't put your name on, on blast like that. Uh, yeah, it's actually mi mitral valve prolapse more than mitral regurg. So that's correct. MVP, about one, four, one fourth of patients will have mitral valve prolapse. Whether that extends all the way to mitral regurgitation, uh, not always. Mitral valve prolapse, i.e. the uh, mitral valve leaflet just bows into the left atrium. With a little bit of regurgitation, that might happen. But overt MR is fairly rare. So it's tends to be mitral valve prolapse. Okay, let's do an SBA. Let's see if this will work. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. I have to say, I've picked these at random from questions I've written over the years. This is a really annoying question because it's not like a sexy thing where it's like, oh yeah, vagueness granulomatosis with cool antibodies and blah, blah, blah. Because everyone loves those. That's the thing everyone studies for. Stuff like this is what people get wrong on the exam because this is a really kind of boring-ish question. You're like, oh, do I need to look at this? The point is your exam will have stuff like this in there and you need to have a little think about how to answer basic management questions as well. Oh, shit. I think I've, ah, excuse me. Answer the poll question. I've put up the wrong question in my thing. Answer the poll question. Ignore the question on the screen. I have, I'll put that question up right after. Excuse me. I'm using the boring diabetic question first. Use that one first. In fact, let me see if I can, I think it's the next slide. Sorry about that. I've just put them the wrong way around. Here we go. Uh, I'll, yeah, that's the correct slide. Excuse me. I'll put up that question in a moment. But why don't we answer this boring one first? Okay, and Paul, I think that's sufficient time. The options are for this, okay, diabetic patient presents to his GP for routine checkup. The observations are heart rate of 72, blood pressure 138, 85. The urine dipstick is fine. And a urine albumin creatinine ratio is taken, which returns at 72. What's the best treatment option? So uh, why don't I open up the chat a little bit? I wanna have a little more interaction with you guys. What do we think about that albumin to creatinine ratio? High, low, normal. Yeah, it's high. The albumin creatinine ratio is, is fairly high. What is a normal albumin to creatinine ratio? Yeah, that's pretty correct. So everyone's sharing it there. We can see it on the chat. Excellent. So what is the treatment option here? I'll share the results with you. You can see why this is a good question for finals because this creates a lot of ambiguity. Lots of people, uh, lots of people disagree with each other here. This patient has signs of uh, albuminuria, microalbuminuria, because he's within 30 to 300, above 300 milligrams per millimole. Uh, that would be consistent with nephrotic syndrome. So he isn't quite nephrotic yet, but he does have microalbuminuria with diabetes. This patient needs to have uh, control of his albumin. And the number one thing you can do there is to add in some ramipril. That is the best way to preserve kidneys in diabetic patients. The ramipril, or rather ACE inhibitors in general, and ARBs actually, uh, will preserve your kidneys and reduce uh, the tendency to microalbuminuria and reduce protein loss and will reduce the deterioration of kidneys. And it's something every diabetic patient needs to be monitored for very carefully. If the albumin to creatinine ratio rises, i.e. goes above 30, then you need to consider them for an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. There is no evidence for a low protein diet. Uh, sticking a needle into his kidney is probably not ideal as there is a small risk you will uh, lose the kidney. Uh, so it's not great for a guy who's like kind of relatively fine uh, and he's just walked in. So sticking a needle into the kidney, not ideal at this stage, uh, but I can, I can see we're being aggressive, uh, but that's okay. Uh, repeat the test in one week. Well, uh, I don't think that's gonna make any difference. Review in six months. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, that might well happen uh, in uh, lots of uh, lots of practices, but is really not great uh, medical practice because it's kind of ignoring the guidelines. So I think we should treat this guy with some ramipril. I think that would be the best thing. Because the only thing that will happen is if you leave this guy for six months, he's going to probably have, well, he's going to keep leaking protein. The protein itself is nephrotoxic, and he's just going to have worse and worse and worse glomerulopathy. And at that stage, when he comes back and you do a blood test, his creatinine will now be 150. Now you've got a patient with chronic kidney disease. So actually, it's, uh, it's really not great. So we need to treat this guy uh, and uh, not ignore it. 
perfect. Why don't I pull up the actual question I was going to show you so we can do with that one. Sorry about that. I've just mixed up my questions. So where is it now? Excuse me. This is the one, isn't it? Yeah, perfect. Let me pull this poll up. Excuse me. Stop sharing. <sighs> okay. Uh huh. Ah, someone's asking me about the units. The units I'm using are always going to be uh, UK units. So in the last one, uh, let me just think. Now, what is... Uh, so the units in the last one were the SI units. Now, what are the UK units? 30 to 300. I can't remember, to be completely honest, but it's normally like milligrams per millimole or something. Yeah, something like that. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it's the UK units, whatever those are. I think it's milligrams per millimole. I think it's milligrams per millimole. Thank you. So, uh, I think, guys, I'm struggling to bring up this question. I don't know why it's not clicking. Come on, nephrotic. Nephrotic, okay. Just give me two seconds. I'm going to have to edit this stupid poll. And, uh, can I stop sharing for two seconds and just fix the poll question? One moment. Give me two seconds. I think I, the problem is the question was too long. Yes, okay, fine. There we go. I've just deleted the kind of text and now it's it should display to you. Let me share the screen again. Perfect. Okay, great. Phew, we got there in the end. Excellent. I'm going to end the poll there because actually this is relatively, I don't want to say it's easy because I don't want to, um, but actually it's not that easy. It seems that people are really struggling with this. What if I give you a slightly different history? I have a, okay, here we go. I have two versions of this question. Okay. You can have either that one or this one. They will be the identical in terms of um, what the patient has. So a 55 year old woman, with lightheadedness on standing, referred by the GP after an examination with three plus of urine on dipstick. She's noticed constipation for six months and is waiting for bilateral carpal tunnel surgery. That would be the second version of the same question. And what does her kidney biopsy show would be the question. Okay. Both of these will have the same answer. End the poll. The point is both of these people who are waiting for carpal tunnel surgery and with signs in this lady in particular, lightheadedness on standing, constipation, she's got some autonomic signs. This is amyloid kidney disease. Amyloid disease is a little bit complicated. I'm not expecting people to become, let me share the results so you can see how people did. The correct answer is apple green birefringence on Congo red stain. Apple green birefringence on uh, Congo red stain is a typical finding for amyloid protein. Amyloid kidney disease is complex. You don't need to know it in great, great depth. There is an inherited version and there is an acquired version. The inherited version is called TTR amyloid. The acquired one is typically associated with lymphoproliferative disorders and in particular myeloma, which is probably the thing that most medical students will be familiar with. But amyloidosis is a fairly complex kind of issue in its own way. Uh, typically you get immunoglobulin protein deposition uh, and that can be light chains. Those proteins can deposit anywhere. They can go into the heart and you can get pericardial effusions and you can get restrictive cardiomyopathy. They can end up in the, uh, in the carpal tunnels bilaterally. And typically you get this funny history of bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, which is a really odd thing. The other thing they can have is a macroglossia. The tongue can become very large. So a large tongue is typical. They can have autonomic dysfunction because the protein, uh, amyloid protein can deposit in nerves and you get a neuropathy. 
and they can deposit in the kidneys and the patient can become nephrotic. Typically, it's a cause of nephrotic syndrome. Which brings me nicely onto nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome is typified um, in blood tests as a patient having low albumin and high cholesterol, massive proteinuria, greater than 3.5 grams per day, or, uh, or a protein to creatinine ratio of above 300, hypoalbuminemia, so less than 30 grams per liter. And if you're that hypoalbuminemic, you'll also eventually get a leukonychia as well, and peripheral edema. And the reason you're getting peripheral edema and ascites typically is because you have loss of oncotic pressure. The thing in the history that's very typical with nephrotic syndrome beyond this kind of funny story of frothy urine, which actually most patients don't really notice that because I, well, why would you, you, most people just don't notice, wouldn't notice that. What they'll find is that early in the morning, they'll have facial edema. Facial edema is a really, really kind of classic finding in this. Not many causes of kind of peripheral edema like heart failure will cause edema of the face. Facial edema is, is relatively specific as a clinical finding uh, in nephrotic syndrome. It's a really odd finding. To be honest, I've never seen it in anything except nephrotic syndrome. And I see lots of patients with heart failure, but they don't tend to have facial edema. They have edema of the legs. They get this pitting edema in the feet, but they don't get facial edema. And sometimes all the way up to the abdomen, but not the face. Uh, there are two big causes of nephrotic syndrome that come up in SBAs. So minimal change disease is the commonest cause in children. And you'll see this description of pod podocyte uh, fusion on electron microscopy. I'm not expecting you to become experts on kidney biopsy interpretation because that's just not required uh, in junior doctors. But this phrase pops up again and again in SBAs and therefore I'm putting it here. I don't really believe this is useful to be completely honest uh, for doctors to know because I think generally speaking, this kind of thing is looked at by, you know, techs who are experts in this and renal physicians, and they have, uh, you know, they give you a diagnosis as opposed to we give to a junior doctor an electron microscopy slide and say, right, what's this? No one ever does that. So I think, uh, I personally don't think this is a particularly useful thing for doctors to know, but just know it because it does pop up in SBAs. The treatment for minimal change disease is steroids, and it's generally a, a disease of relatively young people. Membranous glomerulonephritis is the commonest cause uh, for nephrotic syndrome in adults. The treatment for those patients is ACE inhibitors. And there is now a relatively new antibody. It was new kind of when I started writing these slides several years ago, but it's not so new anymore. Uh, we're looking for antiphospholipase A2 receptor antibodies, which identifies very specifically and sensitively about 70% of people with membranous glomerulonephritis. It's relatively new. I don't think it's filtered down to lots of SBAs just yet, but I can see it coming around the corner because this is gonna be a new thing that becomes like a routine thing that we all do. So just start looking at it now, because I suspect if you're using older question banks, this will not appear in many places yet, but it is coming. I know because I write SBAs, so I think it is coming. Um, remember that patients with nephrotic syndrome have an increased risk of thrombosis. The reason for that is that when you have nephrotic syndrome, you start losing all of your useful protein. And the reason you also get hypercholesterolemia, for instance, is you use your lipoprotein. And if you don't have lipoprotein in the blood, you can't bind your cholesterol. So you have free cholesterol, which is just much higher. Uh, and you basically also have thrombosis because you lose antithrombin three, protein C, protein S, all of that just gets peed out. And therefore you have a higher risk of venous thrombosis as well. So these patients have a high risk of DVTs. This next one isn't an SBA. I just wanted to see if people know the answer to this. I asked this in my, the last time I did abdominal final, um, uh, where's the chat? The last time I did abdominal, um, at a medical abdominal station, I just threw this at the medical students. There was one guy who got it right, I have to say, quite impressive. Uh, and I think he went on to get the prize that year. Uh, but this is like 2018 or something, it's been a while. So what electrolyte change might you see with low albumin? I can see someone's direct message it to me and it's correct. You might as well put it on the group chat and get the glory there. <laughs> okay, fine. The correct answer, the correct answer is a low calcium. Typically, uh, low albumin goes with a low calcium. And the reason you get a low calcium uh, is I can see questions coming in, guys. I will go through them sequentially at the end. Just, just have some patience. I promise at the end, I'll go through questions. Uh, you get a low, albumin, low, uh, a low albumin results in a low calcium on blood tests because most of your calcium is going to be bound to albumin in the blood. So if your albumin's low, then your calcium will appear artificially low. 
Do, is the patient therefore hypocalcemic with Schwastek sign and Trousseau sign and you know all the tetany and all of that? No, they are not. Because typically, if your albumin is low, and your uh, therefore your blood test says okay, calcium therefore low because albumin is low because it's looking at basically bound albumin. Your free ionized calcium might actually be normal, so the patient won't actually be clinically hypocalcemic. They won't have any of the uh, signs and risk of seizures and all that. The way to check that is to just do an arterial blood gas or a venous gas to look at what their ionized calcium is, which is what most ABG machines will give it to you. Uh, the ionized calcium. You can actually send it to the uh, to the lab as well, but it'll just take six hours to come back. So you can just do it on a gas machine. Uh, so uh, so that will be the way to actually check uh, if your albumin is um, if your albumin is artificially making your calcium look lower. Okay, fine. Well, next question. Let me pull up the polls. I have to say, I'm always surprised by the things that people get right and wrong. The stuff that I would have assumed is easy. And I don't want to make feel, you shouldn't feel bad about that. It's just been, I've just, I'm just too old to remember what it's like. <laughs> okay. So, 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 let, ah, this one will share. Come on, launch. It's interesting when it's too long. I don't know if it's just the units or something. Something Zoom doesn't like. It just doesn't share. This one does share. Okay. A 78-year-old or an 78-year-old for some reason uh, is admitted following a prolonged seizure. He's dehydrated. The CK is elevated to 50,000. Uh, and the serum creatinine is 240. I don't, I don't know what that is in UK. It's micromoles per liter or something, uh, millimoles per liter. Electrolytes demonstrate uh, potassium of 5.9, uh, normal range being 3.5 to 5. Phosphate of 2.2, normal range is 0 0.8 to 1.5. Uh, his urine dip is positive for blood. Which one of the following results is also likely on biochemistry? Well, some of this is moot, of course, but there we go. You can see I was running out of options because I've kind of made one really moot. I love the fact people are still going for hypophosphatemia. You have noticed that the phosphate's high in the question, right? Like I, that was an accident of mine that I shouldn't have put that as an option. And yet people are going for hypophosphatemia. The phosphate's high, so it's probably not that one. Okay, Shelby, it's really interesting to me because I think, okay, if you have been following me on uh, Instagram, I'm pretty sure I've done a question exactly on this at some point. Now, I'm not saying you haven't been doing your homework, but one of my SBAs from several weeks ago is exactly on this question. Uh, not the exact same wording, but it's pretty much this uh, pathology and it explains it. I thought it explained it well. Maybe the SBA doesn't explain it well. That's the problem. Uh, okay, let's. maybe it's my fault. There we go. Uh, okay, the answer uh, in this case, and you can see, am I sharing the results? Let me share results. There we go. You can see it's a decent split. The one uh, answer that everyone, the consensus answer uh, for 48% of people uh, is hypocalcemia. That is indeed the correct answer. Okay, this is a case of rhabdomyolysis, okay? And we can see that uh, this is rhabdomyolysis because this is a patient who's had a seizure. The other thing you may have is a patient who's come in with a long lie in inverted commas. I hate that because it's a very A&E term, um, but anyone who's had a fall and not gotten up for a while, we may have rhabdomyolysis as well. Let's go through rhabdomyolysis in a bit more detail. When you have rhabdomyolysis, your muscles leak uh, myoglobin. Uh, that myoglobin is directly nephrotoxic. It can result in an acute tubular necrosis uh, pathologically. You also get phosphate leaking from inside your cells. Your cells are full of phosphate uh, and your muscle cells are full of phosphate and myoglobin. Both of those things will bind up your calcium and your calcium will drop. Uh, because your cells are leaking phosphate, the phosphate therefore goes up, which is why this patient, as I've already told you, has a phosphate which is above normal. Uh, that's why. The other thing the cells are full of is potassium. So they're hyperkalemic, hyperphosphatemic, and hypocalcemic. Patients uh, have a high CK, as this patient has. They have a hyperkalemia. And this can happen after seizures or a fall. In the textbooks you mentioned, this mentioned, statins causing rhabdomyolysis are vanishingly rare. I mean, I have been a doctor since 2010. Uh, I know that that's very old. And when I started, it was all leeches and, you know, realigning your humors and stuff. But I've been around for some of the newer medications. I have to say statins, I have never seen in real life causing rhabdomyolysis. I've heard about it. I've seen case reports. I've seen it in the books. It's vanishingly rare. I'm a cardiologist. We give statins to, I mean, you come in and I, if, I, if you meet eyes with me, I'll prescribe you a statin pretty much. That's kind of what cardiologists do, right? So 
I've never seen it happen. I've seen muscle aches, but not formal rhabdomyolysis. It's very, very rare. So I think we overdo this statin thing. And I think the newer statins in particular really don't cause this, uh, at least clinically in a significant way. Um, you will see with rhabdomyosis, the myoglobin causing acute tubular necrosis and an AKI, and the treatment is fluids and support, i.e. you just ride out the storm and the kidney should recover. Now, riding out the storm could entail going to intensive care and being on emergency dialysis for a little bit while we wait for the kidneys to recover. Yes, I, okay, I'm going to answer this question very, very quickly. Electrolyte changes in rhabdo is similar to tumor lysis syndrome. It exactly is. Yes, exactly. Because it's a similar kind of principle that you've had apoptosis, or in that case, necrosis of cells, and everything intracellular just flies out. The only thing different with rhabdo is you've got a double hit because the myoglobin is going to do a similar kind of thing. Myoglobin uh, is just going to cause even more glomerular damage and bind up calcium even more. So absolutely, that is exactly the thing. Okay. I haven't put an SPA up for anchor because I just think it's fairly, I, I don't want to say it's easy now because everyone will be like, oh, I didn't know that. It, okay. If you don't know it, you'll know it by the end of this slide. I haven't put an SPA on this because I just thought it's, well, you, you'll get it from people who do easier lectures. Any vasculitis, absolutely any cause of vascular inflammation can affect the kidneys and cause glomerulonephritis. And typically you get the story of fevers, rashes, and kidney disease. That's vasculitis, generally speaking. If you think about why that's happening, it's pretty common sense. The reason is vasculitis is inflammation of the vasculature, right? It's vasculitis. So it's inflammation of the vasculature. And your kidneys are just bundles of capillaries uh, inside the Bowman's capsule. So every nephron is basically high, any end capillary bed, eyes, skin, kidneys are all at risk of being damaged with the vasculitis. Cianca with the new and the newer name PR3, which is basically just Cianca, right, uh, is associated with vagueness. Vagueness is an older term, I must admit, from like 2009, 2010. It's now generally referred to as granulomatosis polyangitis. These are these are interchangeable. Older SPAs were called it vagueness, but Wegener was a Nazi, so now we use GPA. Um, is associated with nasal bridge collapse, sinusitis, and lung hemorrhage and renal failure. Pianca, also known as MPO antibody, is associated with Churg Strauss syndrome and microscopic polyangitis. Churg Strauss is quite interesting, and you need to remember, remember just one odd bit about the history with Churg Strauss. I'm sorry to go a rheumatology on you in a renal lecture, but to be completely honest, if we're going to talk renal vasculitis, you have to know a little bit of rheumatology and antibodies when it comes to that. Churg Strauss gives you this very odd history of an asthma like kind of wheeze like syndrome for a while. These patients are not responsive to the typical asthma therapies. So they have this funny wheeze, which a lot of people on history may think sounds like asthma. It does sound like asthma. Uh, then if you do their blood test, their eosinophils tend to be up, which is of course something you might see in atopic asthma as well. So it's very easy to make this mistake. Uh, and they have a mononeuritis multiplex, uh, which as far as an SBA is concerned, will mean a random nerve somewhere stops working. So it's typically a median nerve palsy or something random like that. That's all a mononeuritis multiplex is. One nerve stops uh, working because of inflammation. That's it. And it'll be a random nerve somewhere. And if I'm writing the SBA, I quite like throwing in uh, median nerve palsy just because it's an easy one. Uh, microscopic polyangitis is just another version of a P. anchor associated vasculitis. Both of these can be positive with MPO. Okay. And both of them can cause renal disease. Okay, okay, okay. Let me pull up this SBA for you and we'll go through it. I'm expecting this one to be difficult. So I'm gonna straight up just tell you, I think this one's hard. Okay, launch. And while you guys do that, I'm going to have a sip of my Nespresso because I am now an old man. All right. Okay. Okay. Interesting. <sighs> well, I expected it to be difficult, to be fair. All right. I'm going to give you five seconds because otherwise it's just dead air and I'm going to get bored. Just pick something. I can't see who's picking what. Only you will know you what you picked. So no one will know. You might as well just go with it. It doesn't really hurt, right? Just pick something. What do you think this is? 
done. I'm going to stop there. Okay. It's been more than five seconds since I said, I'll give you five seconds. Share results. Okay. So now the interesting thing with this question uh, is, is, I mean, uh, the most of the people went for post-tractal cochal glomerular nephritis and most of the people are wrong. The correct answer is IgA nephropathy. This is IgA nephropathy. Okay. Let me go through the post-infection glomerular nephritides or glomerular nephritides. I mean, if we're being correct with the Latin, it's glomerulonephritides, right? Okay. So there are two types of post-infection glomerulonephritis. There's post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, which typically occurs two to three weeks after your uh, streptococcal infection. So I know why you went with sore throat causing it. It, uh, it follows a group A beta hemolytic strep or strep throat. There are no long-term problems. And in the vast majority of cases, just you just kind of recover. You can make the diagnosis because the anti-streptolysin O titer is high in the blood, which tells you that this patient had a strep infection recently. And you may find a reduced C3 level in the body as well, reduced complement uh, C3 level. IgA nephropathy, and this is the thing that differentiates it in the history, is typically after a few days after an infection. Patients typically have a hematuria. And if we did a biopsy, you'd see IgA deposition, which kind of gives it away. Up to 40% get renal failure long-term, and it's associated with celiac disease and henoxia and purpura. And that's obviously, a, you know, it's on the same spectrum. And you might remember the blistering rash from celiac disease, and that celiac is very heavily associated with IgA issues, right? IgA uh, seems to be kind of common to all of these pathologies. And the rash over the buttocks is very similar to henoxia and and indeed celiac, to be completely honest. If I go back to that history, a few days after a sore throat, he started getting unwell. He had an eight month history of diarrhea with stools difficult to flush away. Uh, and the GP has been concerned by his blood being elevated. This guy has had difficulty flushing away stools, which would suggest to you that he's got some kind of malabsorption. Post-streptococcal -strept infection should not be doing that. It really doesn't make any sense. You can get strep throat, but typically it's a few weeks after strep throat that you would get renal failure in post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. This is way too early for that. This is more typical for an IgA nephropathy. And uh, did that urine dip is positive for blood and protein. Can I ask something actually? On the, on the uh, issue of a urine dip, what do you reckon? I'm, I haven't got an SBA for this, but I'll just close the poll and open the chat. What do you reckon the urine dip uh, being positive for blood here uh, shows? Is that blood in the urine? Or what, why do you think that uh, urine dip is positive for blood? This guy with the seizure or the long lie or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, myoglobin. Myoglobin can make you have a positive urine dip for blood, even though there's no blood in there. That's exactly right. It's one of the differentials for having a urine dipstick that's positive for blood is the fact that it's myoglobin. It can make it falsely positive. So this may actually not be blood. It's hard to know. It's myoglobin. All right, let's keep going. Da, da, da. Where is the slide now? Okay. Glomerulonephritis. The key finding with glomerulonephritis, the absolute pathic mnemonic thing, like if we read this in an SBA, it's glomerulonephritis, you don't need to read any further, is red cell cast. That's pathic mnemonic for glomerulonephritis. If you see that in an SBA, it's glomerulonephritis. Typically, patients have a history of hematuria and hypertension. There are other causes of glomerulonephritis other than the ones I've kind of already mentioned. There's anti-glomerular basement membrane disease, which is called good pastures, which I'm sure you've run into again and again in SBAs. Uh, and typically that's associated with lung hemorrhage and hematuria. Just be aware that that story is relatively similar to a vagueness granulomatosis where you can also get lung hemorrhage and uh, glomerulonephritis, which may cause a bit of hematuria. The thing that's different with vagueness, of course, is that you're C-anco or PR3 uh, positive and uh, you have a sinusitis as well. That's the key differentiator there. You can get analgesic uh, glomerulonephritis long-term because of renal papillary necrosis. And that is a little bit of an odd one uh, it's, I, to be completely honest with you, I've never fully understood this. I mean, I, I keep reading papers that explain that it's renal papillary necrosis because of ischemic damage, blah, blah, blah. But I, I have found it a little bit difficult to get, wrap my head around exactly why the path is happening that way, uh, to be completely honest. It's some kind of coagulative necrosis of the renal papillary, and it's, it's associated with a variety of causes, typically NSAIDs. There are some hereditary renal syndromes that you need to be aware of. There's the classic one, which is Alport syndrome, which is sensory neural deafness associated with renal failure. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Uh, and this is a issue with type 4 collagen uh, that patients are born with. Now, type 4 collagen can be found in the ears and the kidneys, uh, and which is why uh, this is the combination you get. You can actually also get type 4 collagen in the eyes, and they, these patients do also get eye abnormalities as well. Polycystic kidney disease, we've mentioned. There are two versions. There's autosomal dominant, which is much, much, much commoner than autosomal recessive. Uh, and we've already mentioned the risk of subarachnoid hemorrhage, intracranial hemorrhage because of barrieraneurysms. Von Hippel-Lindau syndrome uh, is relatively rare. Uh, it's autosomal dominant, and it predisposes you to uh, renal cell carcinoma and other cancers as well, and pheochromocytoma. And it's due to an abnormality in the Von Hippel-Lindau gene. I have to say, I found this, uh, I don't really remember my chromosomes very well. I was never one of those medical students. You know, the ones who are like, oh yeah, that's chromosome 16 short arm and blah, blah, blah. I was never one of those people. But this one I do remember is chromosome three because VHL is three letters. And this was on chromosome three. And that was how I remembered it. I, I remember that one, if nothing else. The VHL gene is located on the, actually it is the short arm of chromosome three. And I remember it's the short arm because the V is written small and everything else is capitalized. So short V3, short arm of chromosome three. Uh, and that was how, that, see, it's stupid, but that's how I remember it. Uh, and it's also more dominant. And finally, I'm gonna discuss a little bit about um, TMA. Very, very, very briefly. I have to say the scope of this talk, let me just see where we are for time. I'm sure I'm gonna overrun now. Yeah, it's just gone 12. So I do apologize, guys. I, know I said I wouldn't overrun, and I have overrun again. I'm going to keep going if that's okay. But obviously, if you want to leave, I can't stop you. You can just go. I have no idea who's staying or going. But I'm going to finish these last like four or five slides because I think they are useful. And uh, the most useful bit is coming up. Um, can anyone tell me in the chat uh, what uh, TMA stands for? while I try and find my mouse. Come on, where is it? Okay, I don't think, I don't know if you can see my mouse at all, guys. Thrombotic microangiopathy. There are two different kinds which affect the kidneys. There's TTP, which is thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, and there's hemolytic uremic syndrome. TTP gives you this pentad of fever, neurological abnormalities, which can be anywhere from kind of generalized depression all the way to uh, encephalopathy, renal impairment, a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. And remember, a maha on blood tests is, is typified by the presence of schistocytes uh, on a blood film. That The schistocytes may also be called cell fragments and a thrombocytopenia. Uh, with the maha, the odd thing that differentiates it quite nicely from a disseminated intravascular coagulation and I know this is not a hematology talk, but it is relevant here. A maha is different from DIC because in maha, your clotting is entirely unaffected. It should not be affected. You get low platelets, but the clotting, the prothrombin time, the APTT, all of that stuff should be normal. In DIC, all of that is abnormal. Uh, and these patients get this because of an antibody to a metalloproteinase, which may be acquired or inherited in very, very, very rare cases. Hemolytic uremic syndrome. Uh, as far as you need to know, because there are two different versions, it's atypical and typical, but as far as you need to know, hemolytic uremic syndrome is associated with a recent colitis caused by E. coli or 157. This is typified by a lack of neurological abnormalities, but they do get a maha, so they have cell fragments, thrombocytopenia, and there is no particular antibody that uh, is detected in most HUSs. Okay. Now, why am I going to give you this clinical scenario and talk you through it? I'll tell you this. This is one of the commonest things I have seen come up in medical finals, dealing with a patient with acute renal failure, just talking to the examiner about how you would go through the ABCs and all that with this. And I think it's really, really relevant if you're a finally medical student that you know how to handle this question, because this is what the OSCE kind of back and forth really is all about. Then kind of, if you don't know how to handle an emergency, I really don't think we can put you on the wards as a junior doctor. And it's as fundamental as that. It's almost irrelevant if you know every antibody, if you can't tell me how to deal with an asthma attack. Like I can't actually put you on the wards if you can't do that. Most people, I should rush to add, will pass this, right? 99.99%. No one, you know, it's very, very, very unlikely to fail uh, medical finals. But dealing with this in a way that's competent and makes you look very impressive can be a little bit tricky because it's... Um, 
well, it just is a little bit harder to handle this kind of question because it's it's pure clinical medicine with like someone who knows much more clinical medicine potentially than you do, frankly, right? Doctors just have been around for a bit longer. Patient presents unwell for a few days, comes into hospital, nurses note he hasn't passed urine all day. And this is a really typical junior doctor scenario. And I can see a couple of people who are listening to me who came to my medical finals course last year. It's good to see you again. I presume everyone passed uh, and you're just here because you're enjoying it. I hope uh, that's the reason you're here. But you will remember uh, that this, this, if you're a junior doctor on the wards, nurses will call you with this uh, you know, once a week. This is a typical junior doctor scenario. Like This is what happened to me every week, no matter what job I did. This is very classic. And it always happens at 5.30 p.m. on a Friday. That's typically when it happens. So you assess this patient, do your ABCs, uh, make sure he's alert um, and ask him if he wants to pee. Like you can just ask him if he wants to pee. Uh, and he may obviously say he's obstructed, you know, it's difficult passing urine and that'll tell you the patient is likely to be obstructed. Uh, you examine the patient, right? You can check their heart rate, the blood pressure. The specific bit of exam that you want to get to is the abdomen and feel for a palpable bladder because of urinary retention. Uh, if there is a bladder scan around the ward, it's useful to get that. That's an ultrasound scanner that most of the London medical hospitals that I've been exposed to have. And I think most hospitals probably have something like this, which is just a thing you put on the abdomen and nurses are trained to use it. You click one button, it tells you how much urine is there. You can get a residual urine volume, basically. Uh, you do that and the patient says he doesn't feel like peeing. He's a little tired sounding, but he's alert enough and there's no palpable bladder. What do you want to do next? Well, I think it's useful at this stage to take some bloods. A gas uh, may, would help. I think a blood gas is one of the most useful things in a situation like this because you want to see if he's acidotic. You want to check the electrolytes, particularly the potassium I'm starting to worry about. If this guy is in renal failure, that's the one I'm really looking for. I want to make sure the potassium is safe. At the very least, I can document that at whatever, 5.45 p.m., the potassium was X, Y, or Z. So that's important to know. Glucose is generally helpful in anyone who's unwell. He was a bit tired sounding, so maybe we can check if he's hypoglycemic. I would catheterize this patient at this stage. He's not peeing, and uh, he's got reduced urine output. He's oliguric. He needs to be catheterized to monetize his urine output. And at this stage, uh, generally, the question comes up, what is normal urine output? Now, I'm not going to open the chat in the interest of time. Normal urine output is 0.5 mils per kilogram per hour. So generally speaking, for a 60 kilogram man with 60 kilograms without being significantly obese, I would expect a 60 kilogram man, which let's be frank, most men are not 60 kilograms. So we are lowballing it here, would be about 30 mils an hour, roughly. I'd expect 30 mils of hour, uh, per hour of urine in a 60 kilogram man. So you can just weigh, uh, work it out by weight, half a mil per kilogram per hour. But as a rule of thumb, 30 mils per hour is the absolute minimum in the average person you sh should be expecting. So you need hourly urine output. Ask the nurses very kindly if they would start a urine output chart and monitor the urine output hourly. Uh, and any urine you do find, any drops that come out, you want to dipstick the urine because you're looking for blood and protein because you want to make sure this is not a glomerulonephritis or something. You examine the patient, make sure he's not fluid overloaded. And by that, it's easy. You just look at the JVP. Does he have crackles in his chest? If he's not requiring oxygen to oxygenate, uh, he probably doesn't have pulmonary edema as a very good rule of thumb. Then uh, you could try a little fluid challenge. And one question that always gets asked is how much you want to give. I personally never, ever give more than 250 mils over an hour. I never do more than that unless the patient is actually tachycardic or lightheaded and has signs of hypovolemia. I only give small amounts of fluid because it's easier for me to give a little bit and add more. Uh, and it's safer than giving a liter and then the patient's in pulmonary edema and you're like, oh shit, how do I take that off now? It's much harder. So I give generally small amounts. So 250 mils over an hour is like one big glass of water. That's a reasonable amount to give and uh, you can see what effect it has. AKI is defined by a 50% rise in creatinine from baseline or any patient who's oliguric for at least six hours. And of course, there's another definition. This is from the textbook, uh, uh, or rather from the guideline, I should say. Uh, 26.5 micromoles per liter increase in creatinine in 48 hours. Obviously, you're not going to remember that, but you could just remember a rise in creatinine. I think the first two are more useful to remember, and certainly the oliguria is a very clinical marker, and it's a more useful thing in practical terms. If he's not peed all day, that's, that could potentially be oliguria. At this stage, I want you to engage your brains and start thinking. 
why has this happened? Uh, the causes are, of course, pre-renal, renal, and post-renal. Let's target them individually as a doctor. Pre-renal means he's hypovolemic or he's got sepsis of some kind, and a fluid challenge is an appropriate thing. Of course, you'll have done his ABC, so you would have checked his temperature. Renal causes, so you're thinking some kind of damage to the kidney itself, glomerulonephritis, acute tubular necrosis. Well, uh, ATN is generally damage following ischemia, so that could be secondary to pre-renal. So if he's had ATN for a while, uh, sorry, if he's had a pre-renal hypovolemia for a while, you can get ATN secondary to that, which is basically an ischemic damage to the kidneys. You can also get all of uh, ATN secondary to lots and lots of causes, sepsis, drugs, lo lots of things cause an ATN could be a tubular interstitial nephritis. And my uh, most recent SBA, uh, which we reposted, I think, in the last couple of days, uh, is on tubular interstitial nephritis, which you can read about, which is effectively just an inflammation, uh, like an allergic reaction affecting the kidneys. Post-renal uh, is, of course, typically your uh, surgical causes in inverted commas. So it'll be renal stones, it'll be some kind of bladder outflow issue, like a bladder tumor or something. And most of those can be detected by symptoms and signs and catheterization should sort them out if it's just a urethral issue. And of course, don't forget medications can cause a lot of problems. So just look at the drug chart. You want to make sure this patient hasn't been overloaded on ACE inhibitors, ARB, spironolactone, gentamicin. All these things are nephrotoxic. There are bigger lists than this, but those are your classic ones um, uh, that are like typically encountered. And one final thing, if you really want to be impressive, you want to just make sure the patient did not have a CT scan or a coronary angiography recently. Because the contrast we use for x-ray imaging, iodinated contrast, can cause contrast nephropathy. And uh, typically, you would see that at 48 hours. Now, as an interventional cardiologist, of course, I'm familiar with this because, unfortunately, it is a complication that we warn patients about that any kind of angiography with iodinated contrast, which is the same thing they would use for a CT scan, can cause contrast nephropathy. Generally, it's at 48 hours that the creatinine starts to go up. Okay, so you do all that, three hours go by, and you come back to check on the patient. In three hours, he's past 65 pills. I'm actually taking you through an exact scenario that I took a medical student through in finals um, in 2018. This is exactly how the conversation went. What next? I want the medical student to then tell me this is now a medical emergency. This patient is clearly oliguric, right? He's passed in three hours, 65 mils. That's nothing. Like that really is pittance of urine. There's not much at all. This is a real problem. Uh, and this patient could get incredibly unwell, life-threateningly so if he's just left. So reassess, get a new gas, fine, check the new potassium. It's been three hours. Maybe the potassium's up. Maybe he's more acidotic. You want to escalate now. He's failed a fluid challenge. And what can go wrong at this stage? Well, one of these things, potassium fluid acidosis. Eventually, with renal failure, he can have a uremia. How do you manage a high potassium? ECG, put the patient on a cardiac monitor to monitor for rhythm disturbance. If they have high potassium with signs of ECG changes, I want you to give them 10 mils of 10% calcium gluconate or calcium chloride, whatever they use in your hospital. That will do nothing to the potassium. The potassium does not get touched by calcium gluconate. It will stabilize the cardiac membrane and it will reduce, uh, reduce the ECG changes. But it's basically a stopgap. You will buy yourself up to an hour of stability maximum and then the ECG changes will likely come back. But it gives you some time so you can give them some insulin dextrose which will reduce the potassium. How long does insulin dextrose last for, guys? If you give insulin dextrose, how quickly will the potassium go back up? Chat is open. Yeah. So you give the insulin dextrose over an hour, right? But the, the, the effect of insulin dextrose is roughly about four to six hours. Unfortunately, your shift is eight hours, so you will need to come back in four hours and check on the patient, and I suspect you'll repeat the gas because you're a very good junior doctor who was trained by me, and then you will find that, huh, the potassium was five, then it was four, and now it's five again, So, or well, let's say six, six, four, six, and uh, unfortunately, insulin dextrose only lasts four to six hours, so 
it will definitely go back up. All you're doing with instant dextrose is forcing the potassium into the cells, and then it'll just slowly leak back out again in about four to six hours. So unfortunately, not long enough to pass it on to the next shift. It'll be your problem again very soon. In a real emergency, you can consider salbutamol nebulizers. That will reduce the potassium as well. So unless your patient has a real contraindication to this, to beta agonists, you could consider some salbutamol nebs as a real emergency treatment. And I'm talking 6.57 potassiums. You could consider this. And if you've got more time to play with calcium, rhizonium is a um, potassium binder you could consider using in their diet. Fundamentally, you can bring your potassium down by putting the patient onto dialysis or emergency filtration in an intensive care unit. And the final thing I'll throw at you, which is not for you to use uh, ever without discussion with a registrar, is to consider sodium bicarbonate. IV sodium bicarbonate will bring the potassium down, but this should come from a senior doctor. So not from a junior doctor. It will work, but you are messing with the biochemistry quite a lot there. But it, in a real pinch, I have used it with some success. Which brings me on to indications for renal replacement therapy. And this is something I want every medical student to know uh, inside out, because this is one of those pass fail things. If you don't know this, this one slide, I really will struggle to pass people. <laughs> you need to know indications for renal replacement therapy to be a junior doctor. You must know this. You absolutely, there's no excuse not to know this. Patients who are uremic with complications of the uremia, which typically means uremic encephalopathy or uremic pericarditis. That's an indication for emergency dialysis. You might hear a rub, which is best heard at the left lower sternal border in held uh, inspiration with the patient sitting forward. It's a triphasic sound. You hear it uh, because of atrial, let me get this right now, atrial systole, ventricular systole, and ventricular diastole. You hear three different sounds. And it just goes like, it's like a rubbing sound. Um, they say it's a little bit like uh, two bits of leather rubbing against each other. Uh, it's not quite similar to a, para, to a plural rub, which is a different kind of thing. But once you hear it, you'll never forget it. And in held inspiration, you can hear it at the left sternal border with the patient sitting forward. I have to say, it's not super sensitive, but it is very specific. If you hear it, nothing else is causing that sound. That is a pericarditis. The most sensitive and specific sign, let's do some ECG. So I open the chat. This is the last slide. What is the most sensitive and specific sign on an ECG for pericarditis? Yes, it's PR depression. It is PR depression. It is not saddle-shaped ST elevation. It can happen with pericarditis, yes. But the single most sensitive and specific sign is PR depression for pericarditis. Okay. And if you ever want to see uh, PR depression, just go to any dialysis unit and pick up an ECG for any patient who's on dialysis because most of them are chronically uremic and they tend to have chronic, like mild pericarditis. They almost all have a little bit of pericarditis going on. The other indication for emergency dialysis is refractory hyperkalemia, refractory pulmonary edema, and refractory metabolic acidosis. Emphasis on refractory. Having a potassium of 6.5 or 7 doesn't mean you get dialysis. But having a potassium of 6.5 or 7, after you have tried insulin, dextrose, salbutamol, nebs, every little medical trick you can try and it's still high, that's an indication for dialysis. So it has to be refractory. Refractory to medical therapy is what we mean by that. So pulmonary edema on its own, bad, yes. Consider dialysis, yes. But it doesn't mean you definitely get it unless the patient cannot have frusamide or the frusamide doesn't work or something. You have to try some medical therapy first, all right? And the one final thing I'll throw on here because it is technically accurate, an indication for emergency dialysis includes drugs. So if you are on, have had certain drug overdoses uh, in A&E, certain drug overdoses, they can only be removed by dialysis. So there are certain uh, situations there where we would use dialysis as well. It's coming up to 1220. Ugh. Let me see if I can. Can I give you one more slide? I was going to skip this, but we might as well do it. Our last slide, last slide, last slide. What options are there for renal replacement therapy? Okay. There is no such thing as emergency. Okay. When you go to intensive care, 
you are not having dialysis. You're having this thing called continuous veno veno hemofiltration, which is, uh, or in inverted commas filtration, you hear ITU doctors talking about filtration. This is a very mild form of dialysis. This is not formal hemodialysis. It's, it's similar, but it's hemodialysis is this hardcore thing, which you have here, it's on the next thing. Hemodialysis is three times a week over four hours. Like that, it's the hardcore thing you have over a tessial line or a fistula. Filtration happens over 12 or 24 hours. It's much gentler and is more useful in an emergency because it's, it's gentler on the cardiovascular system so you don't drop the blood pressure, et cetera. Whereas hemodialysis is a little more kind of for outpatients who are relatively well with a decent blood pressure. It's much more cardiovascularly demanding to do that. So in an emergency, we generally don't do this. Crash landing onto dialysis in inverted commas requires normally a period on filtration and then you get stepped down onto dialysis effectively. And remember, of course, with long-term dialysis, there is a risk of endocarditis, particularly the tricuspid valve can get involved because that's the first valve you will encounter coming into the venous system. So it'll be the first valve that can get infected in the heart. So typically as a cardiologist, we see this all the time, the risk of endocarditis is there. Peritoneal dialysis, of course, is a, it can be continuous or automated, continuous ambulatory or automated. I'm not gonna go into it in great depth there. And finally, renal replacement therapy option is renal transplantation and that's it i'm going to finish there i have one more poll to give you before you run away into the uh, rest of your saturday if you'll indulge me for two seconds i will really appreciate it for one last question uh just because i'm trying to get an idea of what people actually would be interested in i'm trying to put pick a date for our revision course dates now i know people keep voting for final week of december but i'm trying to i won't avoid you know in january it doesn't have to be in the middle of your, I'm not going to pick Monday two o'clock, obviously. It'll be times when you can actually make it. Uh, but final week, December, I was kind of hoping people would just want to be on holiday, but clearly not. Uh, and then I'm going to just go through the questions. I'm going to open the chat and go through the questions while you answer that. Let's do that. Kush, uh, yeah, excellent uh, mnemonic. I got to say, I've never been a mnemonic kind of guy. They just never stick in my mind, but mnemonics are excellent for people who can actually remember them but I'm too stupid for that kind of thing. Okay, da, da, da. I thought tessio lines were not ideally left in for years because of risk of SVC stenosis. Yeah, there is a risk of SVC stenosis, but they, uh, what I mean by um, the tunneled versus non-tunneled lines is that tunneled lines can stay in for at least months, if not years, and they are sometimes are in for genuinely years. Ideally, you don't want to do that. You want to move them onto a fistula. A fistula is the best way to do hemodialysis. And to be completely honest, ideally, you want to transplant. Uh, but it, but basically, in or in length of time terms, you can have a non-tunneled line in for up to five days. Some people would push that to seven days. There are some centers which might go beyond that. But generally speaking, they have a, very, a relatively high risk of getting infected. We have to change lines all the time. Um, a tunneled line, you have the option of going months to years. And of course, the longer you go, the longer the risk of issues. And I am uh, officially as a better longer term option and better than that would be a transplant. Can I explain HLA-DR? Uh, well, HLA is human leukocyte antigen. Let me go back to that slide. Give me two seconds. So, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. where is it now? Oops, sorry. Here. Here we go. This is the slide. So human leukocyte antigen is just a, a major histocompatibility complex thing, which kind of demonstrates your uh, protein epitope to your own inflammatory, uh, your own immunological cells. And HLA-DR matching is the most important matching because it predicts long-term uh, risk of rejection. So that's the most important one. HLA-DR is the most important to get matched after ABO, uh, followed by HLA-B, followed by HLA-A. So in that order of importance of decreasing importance. HLA-DR is the most important, then B, then A. Encephalopathy, scratch marks, questions, questions, questions. What does pericardial rub sound like? So I've already explained that. It's a triphasic sound in held expiration. I'll try and find a nice sound uh, file online and play it for my next talk, just at the beginning, if I can find one. It's a difficult one to capture. I have to say, it's one of these things, it's really, really... I'm never a big believer in having sound files for murmurs. I do them because medical students like them, but it's much easier if I'm there at the bedside and you can just hear it. You can never quite hear exactly what I'm hearing with my stethoscope. It's, it's always slightly different. 
let's keep going. Uh, I don't really get albumin creatinine ratio. Do you mind explaining? Sorry. Yeah. And albumin creatinine ratio is simply the ratio of albumin to creatinine in your urine. So you send a urine sample to the lab and you do an albumin to creatinine ratio in the urine. That's simply all it is. You can do albumin creatinine ratio, which is typically what we do in diabetics to monitor for nephropathy, or you can do a protein creatinine ratio, which is what we do specifically when we're looking for um, nephrotic syndrome from other causes. Microalbuminuria is often the earliest sign in diabetic patients of uh, protein loss. And the reason for that is that albumin molecules are actually small enough to get through the Bowman's capsule. But generally speaking, they can't get through because the uh, layer of the basement membrane is negatively charged, which repels the albumin. So the earliest damage you can have to that membrane to let the albumin through, uh, so the earliest damage you can have to that membrane will only allow albumin through. Bigger proteins won't make it through there, but albumin will. So microalbuminuria is often the earliest sign of very early damage to the, um, to the glomerular basement membrane. And it's just a fairly useful thing. To be completely honest, the scope of this talk, one hour-ish, isn't really enough to go through detailed path like that. And I don't think medical students need to know it in that level of depth, but it is, I have to say, uh, I do think the Bowman's capsule is my favorite part of the kidney, which I'm sure you're thinking, yeah, mine too. Yeah, and we are in good company there. Okay, let's keep going through. Uh, at the end, you said there's an increased risk of thrombosis in nephrotic syndrome. Why? Okay, so nephrotic syndrome has an increased risk of venous thrombosis. And the reason for that is that in nephrotic syndrome, you pee out a lot of the proteins in the blood which are controlling your coagulation cascade. You lose antithrombin-3, you lose protein CNS. And if you lose all of that, then you have a tendency to clot more than you have a tendency to bleed. Okay. And uh, someone says, nice one, Evan, which is awesome. Um, I don't know who, what that is <laughs> referring to, but let's keep going. Don't we usually do corrected? Uh, yeah, corrected calcium will, uh, will account for the albumin. But, uh, but of course, uh, you know, this is like a more of a, that's just me asking like a general medical <laughs> thing just for fun. This is how I have fun. You got to let me have my questions. Uh, I think we do protein and CNS. Oh, correct, correct, correct. Electrolyte changes similar to TLS. Yes, correct. Hyperkalemia. Why is there hyperkalemia in rhabdomyolysis? Okay, well, your, um, your intracellular environment is full of potassium, uh, whereas your extracellular isn't. So if you burst a bunch of cells, whether through necrosis or um, apoptosis, you will get a surge of potassium because a lot of the intracellular stuff is just full of potassium. Simple. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, going through. Sorry, there's so many of these. Uh, I had made it interactive as well, so it's not your fault. Uh, what? Why does salbutamol help in hyperkalemia? Well, salbutamol causes your potassium to go intracellularly. Uh, it's, it's to do with the receptors of the beta adrenoceptors. That's why. So salbutamol will cause uh, potassium to move intracellularly. How do some people use? I have seen some people use diuretics for hypokalemia. How often does this happen? Obviously, that's fine. There's a fine balance with further exacerbating the AKI. Yeah. Um, I think you mean diuretics for hyperkalemia? Because typically, loop diuretics will cause a hypokalemia. Um, if, I think that's what you're trying to refer to there, potentially. So uh, the question is, um, can we use diuretics? I think you mean for hyperkalemia, because I don't think you'd use diuretics for hypokalemia. You can, in chronic kidney disease, use diuretics for uh, hyperkalemia. Typically, in CKD, and again, the scope of the talk did not allow me to get into the depths of this, typically in chronic kidney disease, with chronic renal failure, you give patients sodium bicarbonate tablets. You actually give them sodium bicarbonate uh, as an extra to keep their potassium down. So chronic kidney disease clinics, CKD clinics, in most uh, renal centers, will consider for patients who are, you know, creatinine of 400, but not quite on dialysis, these patients with quite advanced stage five CKD, uh, they are kind of heading towards dialysis in the next 12 months, but they're not quite there yet, right? But their potassium is now 5.7 all the time, and you start worrying about it. If you give them sodium bicarbonate 500 milligrams twice a day or three times a day or one gram BD or something, that kind of dosage will bring their potassium down to four point something pretty much all the time. Uh, and that's a useful trick. The other thing you can do is give them uh, furosemide, but the furosemide is more useful, I think, for actually uh, keeping the fluid balance in check. And typically these patients need massive doses of furosemide because their functional nephrons are very small uh, in number. And therefore they need like 120, 240 milligrams of furosemide orally daily uh, in big doses. I think guys, uh, there is 
quite a lot of, I think that I'm going to stop there if that's okay. Would you please join this group? And if you have any questions, please, please, please post it there because some of the questions are really good. And I like to like write kind of long explanatory answers. So I'm going to put them on this group and start arranging them into gastro and respiratory and different topics. I think that's the benefit of the group, which I can't do on the page. So do consider joining this group. I hate social media. I think it's a terrible uh, like sickness in society, but I have no choice but to use it. So please do uh, use it. Uh, and uh, we can try and keep in touch through this platform, Facebook, which I absolutely hate and wish would go away. But please join this group. Okay, uh, last question then, let me see. Okay, I'm just gonna go through the last two questions because I think these are long questions, so I might as well answer them. If instant decryption was just temporary and salbutamol was just for potassium 6.5 emergency, what, what are you actually doing to bring the potassium down? You're not doing much, you're buying time. Um, the question, which is a very, very good question, is in a patient with hyperkalemia, let's say it's 6.5 with ECG changes or an emergency, uh, and you're giving insulin dextrose, you're giving salbutamol, these are temporary measures, which is correct, these are temporary measures. What are you actually bringing, doing to bring the potassium down? Because the potassium isn't leaving the body. I'll tell you what I'm doing. As a general medical registrar, non-renal, the most important thing you're thinking at that stage is this patient could go into cardiac arrest with VF in the next hour if we don't bring the potassium down. You're buying yourself six hours to then pick up the phone, either you or your registrar ideally picks up the phone to the renal registrar and says, or the intensive care registrar and says, I've got a patient with chronic renal failure whose potassium is 6.5 and I've given emergency measures now. But as everyone on that phone call will be aware, this will only last four to six hours. And then we're back in the same boat and we just keep repeating ourselves. So what you're doing is buying time to put in a dialysis catheter and taking them to intensive care for filtration or taking them to the renal unit for dialysis. So that's the ultimate thing is that's what they will need. You're buying yourself six hours because you, one hour is a little too short to make you know, beds available and move them to intensive care and all that. So you need time for that kind of thing. And that's the most important uh, reason for doing that. Uh, da, da, da. Uh, D has asked a very a big question there. D, would you email me on um, or send me a message directly on Facebook, and I will we can have a chat about exam revision, kind of at some point. Uh, it's a much bigger question than I can answer here, but just strategies for revision. I think that's a very very big question. Um, can I go over amyloidosis again? I can go over amyloidosis again. Let me go over amyloidosis again for you. And then I'm going to stop after that. Okay. So there is the slide now. It's interesting because when I started cardiology, one of my first, um, I started doing some research in cardiology. And one of the things we did was uh, my research project was on cardiac amyloid. So I actually know quite a lot randomly about cardiac amyloid uh, and amyloidosis in general. Amyloid protein is, uh, can be inherited. There is an inherited type of amyloid protein and some patients have inherited amyloidosis. So if you have too much amyloid protein, that's amyloidosis. Amyloid protein can be inherited, which is a very rare thing. You don't need to know about it much, but it's TTR amyloid, TTR. You don't need to know that. Um, but the more common one is amyloid protein generated from lymphoproliferative disorders, particularly myeloma. You just get lots of immunoglobulin light chains and protein deposition. So that protein that is called amyloid protein can get deposited in different organ systems. It can go to the heart and cause cardiac amyloidosis, which is typically a restrictive cardiomyopathy. It's one of the few causes of restrictive cardiomyopathy that exists. Uh, and you get this diastolic heart failure, but that's all cardiac and it's not very interesting to you guys, I suspect. Uh, you can get the protein going into carpal tunnels uh, bilaterally and you get typically in SBAs, bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome is a very classic finding. The amyloid protein can deposit in nerves and you get autonomic dysfunction in particular. So the patients have constipation or diarrhea, uh, or they have this lightheadedness when they stand up, they get this autonomic dysfunction. Uh, and the thing I didn't put in here is that the amyloid protein can deposit in the tongue and you can get macroglossia, so a big tongue. And patients can, of course, get amyloid depositing in their kidneys and they can get nephrotic syndrome as a result of that. Uh, and that's typically it. That's kind of all you need to know about amyloid. You don't need to know any more uh, beyond that. And the fact that when you do a biopsy, which is how you make this diagnosis, kidney biopsy or wherever, you do a biopsy. And the classic with amyloid is you do a rectal biopsy. But of course, if a patient comes in nephrotic, you can do a kidney biopsy. You will see this, um, this uh, Congo red staining apple green birefringence, which is very, very classic for amyloid. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. There's a 
answer for revision technique two. Can why don't you just message that to me? How do you revise for finals is a very big question. And I think everyone does it very slightly differently. I had my own way of doing it. I have a nice way that I think I teach, but I think it's probably a little too uh, a little too you know too big a question for this forum. I'm going to see what the recording sounds like. If the sound sounds okay, and I'm kind of running out of space on Vimeo and all of that. So if it sounds okay, I'll put it up. I do hesitate because some of these images, um, you know, I, it's not my property. It's from Google and I have used open source stuff, but I do kind of worry about that a little bit. And also I want to encourage people to come live. I think live is just better for everyone. But anyway, I will, if this sounds okay, it'll go up on Facebook. Uh, please do, uh, if you're not doing psychiatry this year, would you please tell colleagues who are to check out next week's talk? Uh, and the week after is psych again. So two weeks of psych, and then we're going to be back to gen med, gen surge, uh, and, uh, and interspersed with other things. Thank you so much for coming, guys. This has been fun for me, as always, and I hope this wasn't uh, too soul-destroying for you. Uh, but as ever, I'm really pleased to see everyone. It's been a great turnout. Thank you so much. I know we're overlapping with another talk. I do my best to avoid other... I know there's lots of people teaching on Facebook now. Uh, everyone's doing it. So I do try my best to avoid all that, but uh, you know, just because I don't want to step on anyone's toes. But it is what it is. Sometimes you just can't avoid it. Thank you.